The last couple of lessons have talked about the ideologies that reject liberalism because of all the problems associated with a liberal economy. Supporters of market economies saw that their liberal systems just weren't perfect, and the increasing support for socialism led liberals to rethink their ideology. Initially, liberal ideologies evolved as a response to the high levels of government controls. Liberals wanted freedom from government. But with the laissez-faire economies came the abuse of the workers and environmental damage. So now liberals wanted to see some government intervention to prevent those abuses. So we see an evolution from negative freedom, freedom from, to positive freedom, the right to be protected while pursuing individual goals. In order to protect people from the abuses of capitalism, government would have to intervene. For example, create laws that state children can no longer work in coal mines or factories, or having progressive taxation where the rich are going to pay more in taxes in order to help the poor. That means an evolution from right-wing ideas to more of the center or even left-wing ideas. This is the evolution from classical to modern liberalism. For example, the robber barons in the United States. While right-wing supporters would say these men were merely striving for individual excellence when they, say, underpaid their employees, most citizens saw them as men who had been born to privilege and opportunity that most people couldn't ever imagine having. Because they had these advantages, they were better able to abuse the capitalist system to their benefit. Liberal supporters wanted to see the rewards of competition and profit motive for everyone, but that could only happen if everyone had the same chance to succeed. One way to do this would be to provide education, regardless of family wealth. With the government paying for education through taxation, socialism, citizens sacrifice some of their wages in order to give everyone the chance to succeed. President Theodore Roosevelt was president at the time of the robber barons, and he pushed for the idea of progressivism. He stated that while employers need to have the chance to compete and make a profit, the workers also need a square deal, so he allowed some protections for unions. He also enforced antitrust laws that prevented monopolies like Standard Oil, who would undercut all of their competitors until they had a monopoly and could charge customers anything they wanted. The idea of welfare capitalism grew during Roosevelt's term in office. Welfare capitalism is a system that's usually at the center of the spectrum or even right of center because it wants to focus on market economic factors, but it also includes social programs. There are some cynics who say the support for welfare capitalism didn't grow out of a concern for the less fortunate, but really just a way to prevent the socialist revolutions that were gaining support in Europe. Taking the United States economy from the right closer to the center continued with President Franklin D. Roosevelt during the Great Depression. Depressions are part of the capitalist business cycle, and supporters of capitalism argue that government should just leave things be because the economy is going to eventually balance itself out. But the Great Depression was taking its toll, and the president believed something could be done about it. He supported the ideas of an economist named John Maynard Keynes and introduced the New Deal to get the United States out of the Depression. Keynes knew that the business cycle does balance itself out, but in recessions or depressions, a lot of people are out of work. Or the opposite, during times of hyperinflation, the poor can't afford to buy the basic necessities. Keynes argued that with some government intervention, the extreme ups and downs of the business cycle could be mellowed. And here's how it works. Governments have two tools they can use to impact an economy. Fiscal policy is the use of taxes and government spending. So your income tax goes to pay for universal health care. The other tool is monetary policy, where the government influences private banks' interest rates by setting the key lending rate from the Bank of Canada. That's where the banks borrow their money from. Monetary policy can also include the amount of money the government prints and puts into the economy. The more money in the economy, the more money people have to spend. A nation-state's ideology will determine how the government will use fiscal and monetary policies to intervene in the economy. During a recession, people aren't spending enough money, and this is causing businesses to have to lay off workers, which then means even less people are spending money, and it's a vicious cycle. Literally, that's what we call it. If the government lowers taxes, the people will have more money to spend, because they're keeping more of their paycheck. If the government increases spending, say by spending a billion dollars on a new highway, there are more people with jobs, and therefore, they have more money to spend. If the government lowers the key lending rate, so banks have lower interest rates, that means the people can borrow more money at a cheaper rate, which means people have more money to spend. 
All of that money will be put into businesses who then hire more people who spend their new paychecks. That's what we call the virtuous cycle. And it's what Roosevelt did with his New Deal. By the government creating jobs for people and providing services, the New Deal increased the demand for products, which then allowed private companies to create more jobs. That's why the system is also known as demand-side economics. Through government intervention, the increased demand will encourage economic growth. Uh, there is a problem with this system, though. If the government lowers their taxes, which is their income, and increases their spending, they're going to go into a debt. Keynes called this deficit financing, and he explained that it's okay, because the other half of the capitalist business cycle occurs when the economy is growing too quickly and is experiencing inflation. Remember, inflation can be bad because the lower income workers won't be able to afford necessities like housing or post-secondary education. So in order to slow the economy down and mellow out the peaks in the economy, the government should reverse their policies, raise taxes and lower spending as part of their fiscal policy, and reduce the amount of money in the system, in part by using monetary policy to increase interest rates. That will take the money out of the economy and slow it down, thus lowering the prices to a more stable level. When the government has more income through increased taxes and less responsibility to pay for projects and services, they're now going to have a surplus, and that surplus can be used to pay off the debt. So then why were so many countries so deep in debt when things were going well before the 2008 recession? Well, when an economy does rebound, politicians don't like the idea of telling their citizens they're now going to have to pay more for less. That's a one-way ticket of getting voted out of office. So to wrap it all up, in the 18th century, support for classical liberal ideas exploded across the Western world. But in the 19th century, the abuse that accompanied those capitalist policies led to a rejection of classical liberalism and support for increasing government intervention, known as socialism. The supporters of liberalism saw these protests and realized their system needed to change. So modern liberals adopted some of the socialist ideas in order to make capitalism more friendly. The 20th century saw the growth of mixed economies through the implementation of ideas like the demand-side economics we've discussed here.